Happy Thursday. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Um, welcome. I'm glad to see you tonight. I'm Edith Michelle, Dr. Beach, and my kids. And um, I'm the director of the EW Strip School of Journalism. And we're here tonight to officially kick off our centennial celebration. 100 years of journalism education at Ohio University. Woo! Way back in 1923, Ohio University offered its first journalism board. And so today was Scripps Day, sponsored by the Scripps College of Communication. And we had eight journalism producers from the EW Scripps Company visiting our classes and meeting with our students. So a special thank you to Mike Cannon. He's here representing the EW Scripps Company, and he's also a journalism grad. Uh, yep. So a special hello to Dean Scott Tixford, who's been hanging out all day with us. Um, and so thank you for joining us tonight. Those of you on Zoom, if you're following us on Zoom, um, welcome out there in cyberspace land. Um, we ask you to please turn off your mic and your camera to improve the experience for all of us, um, for everybody. And you can put your questions in the chat box. Tonight, the Ursula and Gilbert Farkle Prize for Excellence in National and International Investigative Reporting is one of more than a dozen Scripps Howard Awards presented annually by the Scripps Howard Foundation and the E.W. Scripps Company. The Farkle Prize is made possible by a, by a generous gift from Ursula and Dr. Gilbert Farkle to the Ohio University Foundation. It recognizes major in-depth reporting by a journalist or team of journalists that covers stories intelligently and completely and raises public consciousness. Since 2003, Farkle Prize winners have come to Ohio University to talk with students and the community about their experiences in investigative reporting. The 2022 winner of the Farkle Prize is Pandora Papers, a global investigation produced by the Washington Post and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ. Um, the Pandora Papers is an eye-opening tale of money and power in the 21st century. It prompted 20 investigations, brought down governments, and led to anti-money laundering reform in the United States. The Pandora Papers was a mammoth undertaking. More than 600 journalists at more than 140 news outlets in 117 countries. It's being called the largest collaboration in journalism history. Four members of that team are with us tonight, two literally and two virtually. Sheila Alici is an investigative reporter and video journalist for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, and she's joining us from Berlin, Germany. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for having me. We're happy you're here. She is, she is also uh, a partnership coordinator for Asia and Europe, a native of Italy before coming to the United States. Alici was based in Tokyo, where she worked for Bloomberg News and other news organizations. In 1916, Alici was a member of the Japanese reporting team that took part in the Pulitzer Prize winning Panama Papers investigation. Her work has been published by the New York Times, the Huffington Post, and others. She holds master degrees in East Asian studies and journalism, and has published a book in Japanese about the Panama Papers and the new frontiers of investigative journalism. In addition to being a reporter of ICIJ, she was invited to become an ICIJ member in 2017. Ziva there. thank you, <laughs> has been a senior editor at ProPublica since March 2022. 
She supervises a team of national investigative reporters. She previously served as a corporate accountability editor at the Washington Post and led projects there, including the Post award-winning Pandora Papers collaboration with ICIJ. Brand Setter was an editor at Reveal and co-founded The Frontier, an investigative newsroom in Oklahoma. Before that, she spent 20 years as a reporter and an editor at the Tulsa World. She has reported and edited investigations that resulted in the indictment of a seven-term sheriff, the dismissal of an entire state board, criminal charges against a state lawmaker, exonerations of wrongfully convicted people, and new laws to prevent labor abuses and offshore tax evasion. Her investigation into Oklahoma's flawed death penalty process was named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2015. She is on edited and received awards from investigative reporters and editors, the Overseas Press Club, Scripps Howard, and the White House Correspondents Association. Brand Setter served three terms as on the board of IRE Incorporated. Debbie Sinsipper. I've been practicing all day. Is an investigative reporter at ProPublica who spent more than a decade on the investigative team at the Washington Post. She joined the Post investigative staff in 2007 after spending nearly 15 years at the Miami Herald and the Charlotte Observer. Sin Sipper received the 2007 Pulitzer Prize for local reporting for her year-long investigation on housing corruption in Miami, which led to the convictions of several developers and to a federal takeover of the Miami-Dade County Housing Agency. In 2006, she was named a finalist for the Pulitzer in explanatory reporting for her series exposing breakdowns in the nation's hurricane warning system. At the Washington Post, she reported on local nonprofit groups that failed to provide services for people with AIDS, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Troubled Housing Construction Program for the Poor, which led to charges in federal law. Some, some of her other awards, <laughs> um, some of her other awards include the American Society of Newspaper Editors Local Accountability Award in 2014, Robert F. Kennedy Award for Human Rights, also in 2014, Harvard University's Goldsmith Prize for Investigative Reporting, that was the grand prize in 2009, IRE's Book, Book Award finalist in 2019. She grew up in Philadelphia and graduated from the University of Florida in 1992 with a bachelor's degree in journalism. She's the author of two nonfiction books, and she teaches investigative reporting at Northwestern University and is a member of the Investigative Reporters and Editors. And she loves my book blocks. <laughs> Will Fitzgibbon is a senior reporter for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. He's joining us from Nassau, Bahamas, but he's working. I was told he's on the job, and not, not a vacation, he's working. He's also ICIJ's Africa and Middle East Partnership Coordinator. Fitzgibbon joined ICIJ in 2014 and coordinated the fatal extraction investigation that examined the impact of Australian mining companies in Africa. It remains one of the largest pan-African collaborations of, of journalists. He has reported on ICIJ projects about West Africa leaks, Paradise Papers, and Panama Papers. This given has also worked at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London, where he works on politics, the finance industry, and housing, which appeared in The Guardian and The Observer. He studied at the London School of Economic Science, both Paris and the Australian National University. Is this an impressive all-star cast or what? <laughs> now I'm going to turn the program over to Zebra Brandstetter, who's going to serve as moderator for tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
but it's incredibly gracious love and I think you know, I'm the afford that stuff. Um, I'm humbled to be here. I want to thank the school. I want to thank Chris Howard, um, the Marple Prize uh, Committee, and the folks who put that together, the Howard University Foundation. Um, everyone's been so gracious since we've been here, and it's been so inspiring to see the support for the school. Um, we really have a great program here. So thank you so much for this warm welcome. Um, Ashley Marissa Young for her amazing, uh, you know, making her training run as my well. So shout out to her. So I want to set the table a little bit um, with uh, Will uh, Fitzgibbon, who will be on and off the screen as we're showing visuals. Um, and I want Will to be to talk to the folks here, just a brief overview of how these giant collaborations with ICAJ work. I don't think we want to get into the minutia tonight too much of offshore finance, if you want to talk about that afterwards. Before we get tears with it, but we do want to talk about the journalism of it and how this, how how ICIJ and its partners pull this off. So, can you talk a little about, you know, sort of maybe the key metrics of the Pandora Papers trove and sort of how we got started? Thanks, Eva, and thank you very much to the organizers of this event. It's great to be there, uh, virtually at least. And yes, I am in the Bahamas, uh, which among having beautiful beaches is also a tax haven and a place that came up a lot in the uh, in the Pandora Papers. Uh, I think when, as was rightly explained in the beginning of this talk, the Pandora Papers was the biggest collaboration of investigative journalists that the world has ever seen. We're talking at least 600 reporters from I believe around 80 countries who came together more or less in secret working on very confidential, very sensitive, explosive documents about some of the world's richest and most powerful people, from kings to drug traffickers to fraudsters to celebrities. Um, and we pulled that off uh, largely with success, I think in some ways because collaboration has been something that's growing within the investigative journalism community for a few years now. Um, investigative journalism at a collaborative level and globally, um, it's a bit like if you were a participant on the Great British Bake Off, right? If you were a participant, the first thing you wouldn't, the first thing you would do is not make a four tier vanilla sponge cake, right? Far too complicated. You'd start with a basic banana bread and see how you go. And Pandora Papers was a bit like our four tier vanilla sponge cake in that ICOJ has done these kind of investigations for five or six years building that ground work for journalists to trust each other because there are a few things more terrifying than spending a year of your life as a journalist working with hundreds of other reporters and waking up every morning and wondering if they're going to have scooped you right that's not how we as journalists are traditionally taught to work but the pandora papers did work because of this collaborative culture that has grown within the investigative community around the world um, and I think that's a testament to uh, journalists working in different languages and in different cultures um, for the greater public interest. You know, ICIJ and I think all of us on this panel um, from ProPublica and Washington Post and elsewhere, we're big proponents of the fact that if you truly as a journalist want to deliver global impact for the stories that you're telling, then working together is increasingly a must. You know, especially when it comes to money, money that can cross a border Quicker than, uh, quicker than I can take a flight to get to the Bahamas, for example, the, the quickness with which money moves in a criminal or otherwise way means that journalists have to be just as responsive by reaching out to other reporters to get help obtaining documents or help conducting interviews or piecing together threads of evidence that can make a, a story stronger. And that was exactly what we did for Pandora Papers. We're talking about nearly 12 million documents here documents in Arabic, French, Spanish, English, uh, Mandarin, uh, that one journalist or one newsroom would be, I think, physically incapable, intellectually incapable of uh, analysing alone. So with those 12 million documents and with the tools that the team at ICOJ and elsewhere developed, we from our own uh, offices, our own bedrooms in Washington, D.C. or Sydney, Australia or in New Delhi, India, were able to pour over these records and collectively make sense of it. Thanks, Eva. Great. And my follow-up to you, Will, is just touch briefly on the security of this project. Um, no Slack. Imagine a world where there's no Slack, no email, no text. Um, 
you can't store things on your most things on a computer. Like, so talk a little bit about the security problem. Well, security is crucial as a starting point because let's not forget that many of the people whose secrets we as journalists are writing about are incredibly powerful people, right? These are not stories about a doctor or a dentist or a primary school teacher down the road. We're talking about the King of Jordan. We're talking about the president of Ecuador. We're talking about the reported ex-girlfriend of President Vladimir Putin in Russia and some of the wealthiest and most powerful Russians on the planet. So these aren't the kind of people who, from a legal or even a physical safety point of view, uh, you want to be messing with without security procedures in place. Um, thankfully, online security has come a long way in recent years. Online is importantly, important, particularly important in the Pandora Papers because all of these 600 journalists are accessing the 12 million records from one centralized but searchable database that ICOJ has created. So you need to access that from whatever country you're in uh, with encryption, with two-factor authentication for your passwords, with all of these tools that these days allow journalists to better know uh, what their online presence is and also to leave fewer traces behind. So a big part of the Pandora Papers project in its beginning stages is to bring all those 600 journalists up to speed on security matters. Because as you can imagine, a journalist in Argentina might not necessarily have the same security practices as a journalist in Sri Lanka, or a story that I might tell as a reporter in the safety of my home in Washington, DC, could get a journalist in serious trouble in Moscow, Russia, for example, if everything isn't coordinated. So security as it is something that we take uh, seriously from the very start. Thank you for that. So I want to move now to the sort of important phase about this and have Deb start off talking about this and then Will and Sheila, please jump in. Um, talk about the early phases of this reporting and how you were essentially, I liken it to being a tiny boat in an ocean with you know, technical equipment, looking for a fish, but, you know, fish finder, like, just how many documents go? So tell us what that emotional journey was like and how we got our arms around that ocean of that. Yeah, you know, I always thought when I was a young journalist, when I was your age, that I would meet someone in a dark parking garage if you've seen all the president's men, and they would hand me a stack of documents with a red bow on top, and I would go and do my work. And that's just not realistic, right? It's much harder to do investigative reporting. We have to find documents and data and sources, and we have to, you know, look wherever we can to get it. It's not easy. So when they approached us at the Washington Post and said, we have 12 million documents, I thought, this is going to be the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. They're handing us 12 million documents with the red bow on top. Fish in a barrel. Yes, fish in a barrel. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life because... Where do you start with 10, 12 million documents? Um, how do you search 12 million documents? I thought, oh, I'll just put in the names of you know Trump and Supreme Court justices and members of Congress and get a number of hits and it would be super easy and it, and it really wasn't. And so for the first few months, I actually said over and over again, it was like waiting in the muck. You know, it's like, you're blindfolded, one arm's tied behind your back, you're working in the dark and you're trying to make sense of, of these documents. Oh, and by the way, you're doing it with hundreds of other reporters. You have to share your findings, you have to share your notes. That completely freaked me out because I wasn't used to doing that as a competitive investigative reporter. And so what we ultimately figured out is we needed to work the documents in a more organic way to let the stories grow as we search documents. In other words, instead of going in from the top with keywords, we let the documents tell the story. And ultimately, we found patterns and trends, including the ones that Will and I wrote about, which is the impact of uh, the covert movement of wealth in the United States. And how does that impact both you know, the United States and the countries where the money is coming from? But it took a long time to get there. It took a lot of trial and error and a lot of patience. And you know, in any kind of investigative reporting that you do, you could spend hours, you could spend days and not get anything. And then suddenly you have that one document, right? You've had it that one kind of eureka moment and it makes it all worthwhile. And, and over time, over many months, we had that, we were able to find patterns and trends and produce the stories. Sheila, do you wanna to add to that? Um, 
Did you have a similar experience or did you just, you were right in on that amazing check from Minister Yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, the, what I did um, at the beginning, I was one of the reporters at ICAJ who started looking at the documents from, yeah, maybe two years before we published basically. And so when that was talking about how do you start, one, one thing that we did was to look at uh, politically exposed people. Um, so um, we immediately realized that this leak uh, compared to previous leaks offered a very big number of uh, elected officials, politicians, etc., who had used the uh, uh, offshore entities um, for various purposes. Uh, one interesting case was this: um, the prime minister, then prime minister of Czech Republic, who's uh, currently running for president. He's being compared to Trump because he was a, he's a billionaire. Um, he ran on a populist campaign. And um, what's interesting is that when he was elected, he promised to um, to improve transparency, crack down on corruption and so forth. But then we found his name and which was linked through a various a very long chain of shell companies to a twenty two uh, million dollar um, real estate in southern France near Cannes. And what was interesting was um, the the scheme that he had used to basically hide ownership of this villa. Um, what, um, what we immediately real realized at SAJ is that we needed help from journalists in several countries to really understand what was going on there. Because the villa was in France, he was Czech, but then he used the Washington DC, BVI, um, and Monaco shell companies to pull out this, uh, this scheme. And so, and obviously the villa was in France. And so we needed reporters from all of these countries. And this is one of the examples of collaboration that we were really, that really had also an impact. Um, in fact, currently French authorities are in investigating um, Babish, Andres Babish for um, tax fraud. And uh, um, he's also one of the reasons why the European Union is uh, considering a new law to uh, crack down on shell companies. And, um, you know, in Czech Republic, where uh, reporters found the, the smoking gun, which was just through a FOIA request, uh, documents that show that the, his declaration basically showed that he had never declared the property. Um, that was a, that was a big um, scandal. Um, and um, it was also interesting to see how the, you know, how these populist politicians work. Uh, obviously, he has a lot of media companies. And when our colleagues approached him, he never responded to to our questions, um, and uh, only after we published, he put he he um, put a posted on face on his personal Facebook a response, and this is something that we have increasingly seen in the last few years how the use of social media has been, um, you know, uh, how these politicians use social media to manipulate a message and to avoid uh, responses. Um, responding to journalists, but then you know, in the end, uh, the facts just speak for themselves, and that's why I, um, one week after we published, he's lost re-election. So um, this is just a good case study of how the collaboration worked. Amazing reporting, Stuart. Thank you. And um, Will and Deb, I just wanted you to touch briefly on the Fox story. Um, I think a lot of people think of a project like this and think, oh, they were. In the document world for forever, but we we're also on in the field um, going to um, connect um, stories in America of real harm, uh, meeting people in interesting places, um, building trust, going to foreign countries, and looking at the harm caused by the offshore system. So, can Deb, you talk briefly about that and then Will, you can follow up with any observations you have. Yeah, I mean, this was not a story about rich people doing necessarily rich people doing what we think they're going to do, moving money, hiding money, not paying taxes. It was partly that. But but Will and I early on really wanted to find the harm in this. How does it affect marginalized communities all over the world? That was a, a key goal that we had. And we also wanted to tell the story in a way that people could understand it, that it wasn't just a story about 
finance and trusts and registered agents and all that stuff that still to this day makes my head spin. It really was a story about the secret movement of wealth around the world and that movement of wealth deprives uh, and deprive marginalized communities from tax base, higher tax bases and, and other things. And so we really wanted to show that and to do that, we, we traveled, we went to a sugar plantation in the Dominican Republic, for example, and spent time with um, people who are, you know, barely, barely surviving on wages there while the former president of that company moved his money into the United States. And so we really wanted to show the harm and we would do that in any investigation that we do, right? That's that's absolutely important and critical. The other thing we wanted to show is that we often think of offshore tax havens in some tropical island somewhere in the Caribbean, perhaps, but the United States is a tax haven and that there are enablers here in the United States, lawyers and others who allow people to hide their money here. You don't necessarily think of South Dakota as a tax haven. You might think of Belize or uh, the Cayman or something, the Cayman, the Bahamas, or Willis, but not South Dakota. So we got a ton of reaction uh, from that South Dakota story. Do you believe South Dakota is a tax haven? That kind of a reaction. Yeah. And Will, can you tell them about the, what was great at digging out the history and the, the receipts for how this very secret system operated? Uh, the lawmakers, uh, the tape you found, the lawmakers, when they were passing all these. Uh, secrecy laws and South Dakota and all this stuff. Will loves the archives. Yeah, he's like friends with the people in archives all over the world. I do. I do. I, this is this story. I think, like Schiller's example, made clear. Like Debbie's example, made clear. You know, the documents, the leaked documents, in as exciting as they are, in many cases, form five or ten percent of an overall story. We're still doing everything that you're all taught and that we're all taught at school. You know. Uh, reading up on a subject, speaking to experts, going through court transcripts and identifying victims. Debbie did a lot of that in the Dominican Republic case through US courts. Um, yeah, I have probably listened to more hours of recordings from the South Dakota legislature than uh, anyone, especially any other Australian. So someone will give me a award for that at some point. Um, and you do that, as you know, because amid 15 hours of recordings, you find the one 10 sentence, uh, 10 word sentence that just crystallizes everything. And in this case, it was one Republican lawmaker saying to lawyers, sure, we'll adopt this bill. Uh, we don't understand it, but we trust you, basically. Um, and that trust by lawmakers basically handing over the drafting of very important legislation to uh, professionals with an inherent interest in that is really at the heart, according to experts, of lots of the uh, reasons why America is increasingly become a global tax haven. And then, of course, we met with a whistleblower as well in an amazing twist of fate out of the blue. Just a few weeks before I think Debbie and I started looking into South Dakota, we received a, an anonymous email from someone working in the South Dakota financial industry wanting to talk. And that person was incredibly helpful for us in the early stages, explaining some of the specifics, but also in helping at least me motivate me and making me think I'm on the right track. I mean, investigative journalism to me always goes through a cycle of thinking you have a story, not thinking you have a story, you know, uh, drink a glass of wine because you think you've found your story again, crying uh, into your pillow because you think you've lost it again and kind of repeat that 20 times. So this whistleblower was incredibly helpful to keep us motivated. Uh, yeah, and just in summary, you know, a really good project draws on all of those traditional and non-traditional investigative means. And I think Pandora Papers was an example of that. It was like almost like, how do you make people care when you're writing about trust? Like, I don't know how many right. of you like, know what a, like a trust is or a registered agent. Like, it's kind nice. of can be kind of boring, like seriously. And we had to find ways to make people care because it matters. And one of the things that Will and I found, and this was like a perfect reporting moment that doesn't always happen, is we were in the Dominican Republic. It's all of these families um, that work for very wealthy sugar plantation owners, and one of them had moved his money into South Dakota. So that's why we were there, figure out the impact 
on this company that he once ran. And a couple of years before we got there, these families had set up these makeshift shacks where they were living, like tin roof shacks, no electricity, no running water, but they had a community. They built these shacks or these shacks by hand along the you know, edge of the sugar plantations. And one night bulldozers came in, men with you know guns, and in the middle of the night, in the middle of a rainstorm, knocked down these these shacks and, and threw the families out, children, babies, pregnant mom, everything. They had nowhere to go, nothing but the clothes on their backs. It was it was pretty brutal. And one of the little girls at the time was so terrified to leave her shack, she rushed out and left one of her sandals behind. She was like four at the time. It was her only pair of shoes. And she could not go to school for a month because she could not, she couldn't go barefoot and her parents couldn't afford to replace her shoes. So when Will and I went back with our team, we met this little girl who was at that point now 10 years old, it was like five or six years later. And we followed her out to where this took place. And it was now this brush and overgrown area and this and that. And while we were there, she dug into the ground and would you know she found her second sandal that she had lost years earlier. And she started crying and the mom started crying and we got these photos. And Will and I knew right then and there that, that was going to be a pretty significant part of the story. It was just one of those moments where kind of everything came together and we realized what we had and why this mattered. Um, Shula, can you talk about the, uh, how sometimes in a project uh, you actually are able to make um, investigative headway on a target that sort of everybody knows, you know, we're doing something bad or, you know, ought to be investigated, but can't make any headway on it. So that the Sri Lankan story um, and, and, and what you all and what we do. Yeah, sure. So, um, for those who are not very familiar with the uh, South Asian uh, geopolitics, Sri Lanka is this tiny nation south of India, and um, it, it suffered like a 20 year long conf brutal conflict um, that basically still um, left it um, still in a huge public debt. Um, and uh, there was a family that emerged after the conflict that has been ruling the country for for ages, for, for years. And there, there's been many rumors about this family called the Rajapaksa ruling family, uh, looting the country, um, pilfering and like uh, shifting billions of dollars away from it into tax havens. But um, it was very difficult, it is still very difficult to see um, the evidence of that. And the Pandora Papers for the first time offered a small glimpse into how uh, looting uh, really take place in a country like Sri Lanka. We found that one of the um, relatives of the ruling um, politicians um, called Nirubama Rajapaksa, and um, she was also a former ministry, minister. Um, and uh, she and uh, her husband um, were able to, for 20 years, so since the beginning of the civil conflict, to hide uh, millions of dollars um, offshore, but not only offshore. Uh, what was interesting was that they used tax havens to invest in real estate in London, Sydney, um, and uh, Dubai and also buy art that they would store in secretive warehouses in uh, in Switzerland. So this is also an example of how the offshore system um, is not that um, as abstract and how the West uh, and Europe and the big capitals around the world and enablers, you know, white, white collar professionals have helped um, um, politicians and um, to hide uh, money uh, for, for from their own uh, citizens. Um, what was interesting in this case was also the fact that um, we could work with the local journalists, and um, you know the the Rajabaksa family has been known also for allegedly um, being involved in the killing of journalists and definitely threatening the press. Um, so the fact that uh, these local journalists could work with ICIJ was also an important um, uh, part of the, the collaboration because as uh, we were talking about at the beginning, 
Um, in many of these countries, um, journalists are in danger. And so working with uh, colleagues overseas, um, you know, sharing doubts, uh, sharing uh, fears, uh, just having someone who can publish things that you cannot publish um, helps a lot. And it really helped advance the story. It had a great impact, or even though, uh, you know, impact is a very, um, I don't know, it's become a buzzword recently. Everyone wants to have impact. It, it, the problem is that in a country where the ruler, you write about the ruler, it's, it's very impossible, very unlikely that there's going to be an investigation into the subject that you're writing about. And in fact, the president uh, of Sri Lanka, then president of Sri Lanka, who was uh, related to these people that we wrote about, launched an investigation, but obviously the investigation never uh, went uh, anywhere. And um, months later, he was forced to leave the country because people um, you know, didn't even have medicines and gas and started to protest. And then he fled offshore somewhere, probably in Dubai, nobody knows. Um, but anyway, so everyone talks about impact, which is something that we obviously as journalists, investigative reporters, we want to keep in mind, but we also have to be very mindful of uh, where and how this impact, uh, you know, can uh, can be possible. Thank you for that. Um, one of them, uh, I haven't got any questions, I don't have questions by the way, so I have a couple more questions, but can each of you touch on how you um, build trust an investigation like this, if the Washington Post, if you're on CIJ, you're going to a foreign country and trying to get shirt workers to talk to you who might get fired for doing that. Um, you know, how do you do more than just drop in? So Deb, can you hit on that and well, can you talk about how you build trust? I know you work a lot of uh, fellow journalists in those countries. Um how how do you do that? Well, it depends on the situation, but I think so often, like you said, we drop in. You know, and we think we know a place because we've been there for two days or three days and we don't. And, you know, I always I say this to my students at Northwestern, you know, people are, you know, we're, we're complex people. We're more than just the challenges that we face, right? And we all want the same things in our lives. We all want, you know, health and happiness and safety for our children. And I think so often we will drop in and we'll just see someone who is poor, you know, a sugar cane worker. And they're more than that. And so we spent a few, first of all, we went in um, with some help on the ground. We got to know a local friar um, and a journalist. He's like the local radio guy and he's fighting the good fight against these sugar uh, plantation owners. And so he helped us. Um, he kind of vouched for us, right? We need people to vouch for us when we're going in cold. So he helped when we sat down and we had lunch with him and we met families and you know, we spent time there, and and again, we we wanted to go in and very clearly explain what were we doing, why it mattered, and how sharing their story could potentially help. And I hope that ultimately it did. The UN was was involved. Well, we have anything to add to that? I mean, Debbie is a master at getting people to open up and talk, and I think one of Debbie's secrets that I saw a lot in working with her is just like. Debbie said, you know, be a human being. Like, yes, when you interview someone or when you travel to a country, you have certain uh, reporting gets that you need, right? You know, or your editors told you, you need an interview with this person. You know, you have a certain idea for a lead, for example. But at the same time, we're reporting on this for a few months of our lives and these people are living it for the rest of their lives. So balancing what you need professionally with the reality and the understanding that you're uh, exploring some of the most traumatic moments of another human's existence, I think is important and allow yourself in a foreign or an uncomfortable setting to be disturbed somehow. You know, you might have to uh, have a lunch that lasts two hours longer than you thought because that's culturally appropriate, or you might have to take a detour because someone suggested that you go and see where their grandmother lived, for example. Cultures are different and diverse and no one size fits all when it comes to reporting in different countries. And the more that you can do to remain flexible and curious, uh, the better I think your reporting will be. Yeah, I think one of the things I've learned over time, I'm curious if you have, have too, I always used to think it when I was a young journalist, I'm a journalist, I'm a journalist, I'm objective. 
you know, I can't be emotionally involved. And I, I mean, I'm a human being. I'm a human being before I'm a drunk. I'm sorry. And I get mm -hmm. emotionally, you know, I care about people. If, if we didn't, we wouldn't be doing this work. And so it's okay to care. It's okay to show you care without crossing the line, right? Yeah. And there is that line and you don't want to cross it. But I don't apologize for it. I want to get to know people. I want to. I want them to feel comfortable talking to me. And sometimes to do that, we have to share a little bit about who we are too. Yeah. And that's okay to do. Totally agree. The, the more vulnerable the person, the more I have the less savvy they are with media. The more careful you have to be. The more agency you should get in over telling your story. Um, the more follow up there should be to make sure they understand how their stories will be portrayed. They need to own their story as much as possible. And then, you know, stories were, um, I don't remember somebody like that, right? Um, I know you all know that, but, you know, it's just good to hear it. Um, Sheila, is there anything you want to add to that? I just want to um, add that, um, you know, especially when you work in an international collaboration, being um, sensitive to other people culture, uh, people's culture also applies to working with other journalists. Um, you know, uh, we are lucky because we are based in the US and Europe uh, and, you know, we, we can do this uh, specializing investigations and take months to do this. But there are journalists that we work with and who have great experience and, um, you know, to, to share, but who are in a totally different situation. And so whenever you work with someone else, you have to also, again, look at them as people and not just as uh, colleagues that can get you a source or can get you a document. Um, and so part of the work that Will and I do also for ICJ, which is the coordination also has to do to do with this, uh, you know, waking up in the morning with people, with journalists, uh, colleagues slash friends asking uh, for help. Um, or just being frustrated that their editors uh, don't uh, support them. Um, and this is also part of the collaboration. Thank you for that. Um, and well, could you, I think people here will be very interested to know about like the end of phase of this um, and uh, you know, when we approach targets, how that, that no surprises period works. Uh, when you decide to ask Barbara Putin for comment about this, is supposed to get hurt. And how does no surprises work? Well, as uh, Ziva and Debbie will tell you, don't make the mistake that I do with, and put your home address on letters that you send to spokesmen for terrorist groups. Um, but, you know, I think one thing that defines these kind of investigations, Pandora Papers and other large investigations, is if you take the number of people who we've written about and the number of people whose secrets we've in exposed, there have been incredibly few uh corrections, uh, legal threats, let alone lawsuits. And that I think is of course related to the quality of the reporting, but also to the stringent fact-checking that our stories go to and through the rights to reply period, you know, something that I learned very early on at ICOJ and that has an incredible amount of benefits. Um, uh, also some drawbacks, um, we can talk about that later perhaps, is this no surprises content uh, con concept of journalism. You know, every word that I write about you in my upcoming investigation or every, not every word in that it's not word for word, but every uh, kind of factoid, every allegation or accusation, uh, you as a person or a company should have a right to see before we publish that, to contest that, to add comments to, to add nuances to. Um, and that means that you reduce the likelihood that the person you write about will wake up in the morning at 7 a.m., see a push notification from the Washington Post saying Shiller Alecci, you know, murdered her dog and stole a billion dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And if, in my experience, people are much less likely to react rashly or to sue you if they have kind of known, oh, that bastard Will Fitzgibbon is going to publish a story about me in three weeks' time because Will Fitzgibbon has sent you a letter or spoken to you on the phone or spoken to your lawyers, uh, setting out exactly what our investigation has showed. So a meticulous, really reading of the story. Often I'll go through a story once it's finished and once it's been fact-checked 
And I'll go line by line and just see, okay, what am I saying about this person? Or what am I saying about this company in each line? And then I'll put that into a into a letter of some sort and, and eventually whittle it down, edit it a bit and put it into numbered questions. Um, and sometimes those letters can be five pages. Sometimes they can be 30 pages. Um, but it's really it really is uh, to the benefit of the reporting and the um, strength of the story after publication going through that laborious process. Yeah, so in just in closing in that process, so there might have been, so you guys saw the celebrities that were involved in Pandora Papers, right? Uh, so the 15 people writing about Shakira's tech problems, we don't want Shakira getting 15 letters. Um, so we all coordinate, you know, if 10 people writing about the Czech Prime Minister, then uh, we all coordinate and crowdsource our questions, put them all in a letter, and lawyers for all these different media orders do the review if needed, um, so that it's coordinated and we don't look, you know, we're not harassing people with multiple letters. Um, so it's an interesting, very involved process. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about letting them, is it letting them do the story or just the whole fact? It's literally every, uh, we do this in ProPublica as well, um, every assertion, um, every fact, everything in the story where it's like, you know, uh, that could be wrong, or that's that's the way I've interpreted this. That's the way I've synthesized this material. Like anything that you want to fact check, that the person could wake up in the morning and say, "You didn't give me a chance to." I don't know that's any of the story. I would have told you it was wrong. So some lawyers hate hate those. Uh, I find that it's uh, it's a very smart process. Yeah, it's no surprises for them, but it's also no surprises for us. The worst thing in the world is to make a mistake. I mean, it's one of the worst things for journalists. So if we give them a chance to attack us before we publish, then there's no surprises. We can make correct. We can make any change we need to before we publish. So it helps us in, in ten different ways. Um, unless you know the three of you want to make another point, which is completely fine. I, I can help answer questions now. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. So in your work in the international scope, how do you go about literally translating, but also communicating thoughts and ideas, and as well as the little language that you use across different languages, both during the research and writing process, but also during the final publishing process? Well, I'll just touch briefly on that, on how we handle the post side. Obviously, we have U.S. news organization, you know, um, and we are focused um, our foreign desk had some stories uh, that were very focused on, you know, Pinagola and various um, foreign countries. So they had um, foreign correspondents um, who were fluent uh, working on those stories. Um, and then, you know, we brought in translators when we needed to to review our Dominican uh, Republic uh, scripts. Um, we had a Creole translator and a French translator. Uh, no, 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 Spanish no. and Creole in the VR, um, because we were going to be interviewing sugar cane workers Spanish had French. spoke both languages. Um, and so you assess each story each situation. But Will, can you add on to that about the language? We were trying to read documents in Russian and couldn't put things into Google Translate because it's the security risk. Plus it must be wrong. So can you talk about how I say I did it? Uh, I, I think it's in two stages, really. And Sheila will have. Uh, her own experiences you know in the research stage when you're not publishing anything when you're just trying to get your head around what the heck does this document mean uh you know google translate or other uh tools uh such as deepl d -E -E uh are incredibly useful because they give you an overall sense of what you're talking about but like ziva said said you wouldn't rely on uh, google translate to quote a document in a story for example um for that one of the benefits of ICRJ's model of international collaboration is we have reporters who speak nearly all of the languages in the world that we could need um, who are working on the project as well. So in the South Dakota story, for example, we could reach out to a partner in Brazil and say, hey, I, we're using this Brazilian lawsuit uh, just in a passing reference, you know, is the correct term for this embezzlement or fraud? Uh, Debbie and I recently did a story where we had to ask some Spanish journalists 
is the correct verb for this to review or to reassess, for example. So depending on the sensitivity and the exactness of what it is you're qu quoting internationally, uh, working with other journalists is incredibly helpful. But, um, you know, don't over -comp don't complexify things too much at the beginning would my advice would be my advice as you're trying to understand what it is you're dealing with in the first place. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So my name is uh, um, Thank you for uh, coming here and having this amazing presentation. So I have two short questions. The first one uh, for all of journalists, have you ever get any bad threat or kind of threat? And still keep going towards that. That's my first question. Second question, as you know, um, I mean, all journalists have very dangerous people and families. And um, they also have many connections around the world and they can also make impacts around the world too. So do you feel like, do you, do you scare or do you feel any concern uh, when you're in public? Because we know like what Russia did. So you have Russian oligarchs, authoritarian regimes, uh, Saudi things, uh, all of things. Of course, I'm not talking about Shakira or Prince Henry or Meghan Markle. She's scared. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, good question. Right, just very briefly around the horn, I want to ask some more questions. Um, I mean, as a local reporter in Oklahoma, reporting on a guy who had dangerous air rides, like, he threatened me once, but like, journalists uh, in Mexico, in Russia, we had partners in Russia got detained, the president had to leave the country. Um, you know, journalists are being killed there. So we have it good here in the US. We're relatively safe. Um, we're more at risk for being targeted. Well, it's never by some big company threatening to pull ads for publisher who then tells us to stop stop looking into that company. That's more of that kind of pressure that we deal with. But um, and then um, as far as in uh, public, I'm not scared about going in public. Uh, I'm I'm proud of what I do. I let people know. I hear my card all the time. I tell people that come with me, have a news tip that I'm working for them or to tell their stories. And I think we just try to let people know that. You're an outlet to, for them to get their truth out. And, um, you know, you have to believe strongly in what you do and then be open to hearing people's truth, even if they don't like the media, they think your media organization is biased. And, you know, I think just hanging in there and trying to do good journalism sometimes changes people. Yeah, I think that's a good question to ask. And I think journalists in the United States, thankfully, are pretty safe, uh, at least from those types of threats, many other threats, but those types of threats. I have immense respect for journalists overseas who are doing this work. Mm -hmm. And I know Will and Michelle can talk more about that. Well, Michelle, do you have anything about um, sort of uh, threats, um, being yeah. afraid about doing your job or the threats journalists face as part of these problems? Sheila, do you want to take that one? Well, um, so, uh, well, as a European or like some or US based journalist, again, I didn't, I've never felt threatened. But for example, uh, a few years ago, going to Indonesia for a paradise, that was Paradise Papers story. Um, you know, you feel sometimes you go to remote areas, you know, it's, you have just to be, you have to be cautious. The thing though was that, especially as a woman, sometimes it's, uh, you know, you have to be mindful for sure about your surroundings and other things. And um, the the good thing was that um, uh, in that case, I was with a local reporter, a colleague. And so, you know, also um, in that case, um, it helped to have somebody who not only spoke the language, but also understood the situation. And, um, and you know, and I trusted him and he trusted me. So we were able to um, you know, nothing happened and it was everything was fine. Uh, again, also in India, when I went to work in India, I worked with a local reporter who also knew how to, you know, to manage some situations. And so um, in those cases, relying on, coll on trusted colleagues certainly help, as well as uh, preparing beforehand. And, um, you know, without uh, thinking that you are the hero, you just go to places where you need to go, knowing what it is, uh, what the place can offer or what the security threats can be. Um, and that is also part of uh, like respecting the, the people uh, that will host you maybe, or they you will meet. Uh, so it's part of the job too, I think, to prepare for that. 
Um, so I know you've already talked about like the security measures you were so part of the security measures you took to make sure that uh, none of them like land was leaked or anything like that. This is kind of a little bit of a two-pointer, but um, what were some more of those measures that you all took to make sure that the, everything was under wraps? And also, was your concern that if there was a leak or something that another organization would report on it and get it wrong? Or was it that your report would be shut down because of these powerful influence, influencers kind of being in the way? And it's kind of all of that. Like, we all agree. I see that doesn't have like a big, you know, list of things you have to agree to. Or, you know, it's mainly like we go at the same time, we share. Um, you know, those are two main rules. So, what you worry about is somebody being careless with a big piece of this, it gets out there. All of the hard work of these 600 people is then, you know, compromised. The targets know, they can start having press conferences and lawyering up. So, there's that. You know, getting sued yourself, um, just yeah, looking like you're being careless with these documents. The sources, and who I don't know by the way, I don't know who gave the documents to anybody, uh, but the sources who trusted um, these news organizations with these documents, they're thinking it will be careless. Um, so, some of the, um, I was a project manager for the post, we had 60 people working on it at the end, and um, we, um, it was a need to know, they could throw the code name. What was the code name? What was the code name? Aladdin. Aladdin. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's some meetings and, you know, and then people were added to the team, uh, you know, as needed. And we use Signal uh, and, and encryption. Um, and uh, we had different Signal channels for people that needed to be on there, their Slack and their email. We had Iron Key, um, which um, that's something we still about. can't figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lesson in it and I, I use it some, but I mainly didn't want to download these documents. Uh, Unless you just absolutely had to, and then you didn't want to, mainly you don't want to take your laptop through airport security or travel to Russia or travel to some authoritarian country with documents in your, you know, it's going to be in your house. It's one thing, but so those are some of the security measures. Um, you know, um, yeah, it was it's like some more people of course that needs to know, and um, and it's, you know, all of our partners have the same security measures. Um, can add to that. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think you summed that up pretty well. I mean, in addition to the concern about the story, you know, one of the good things about a collaboration of that size is you do not want to be the one journalist out of 600 who screws up everything for everyone else, right? Um, so inbuilt into the size of a collaboration like that is uh, kind of a professionalism among the participants. Remembering that the journalists on this project have largely known each other or been brought together through a system of trust in the first place. But, um, you know, but also remember that lots of these, some of these documents in a number of countries, uh, it's a criminal act to have them in your possession at all, right? So if uh, a journalist was in the United Arab Emirates or Russia, potentially, for example, and as often happens to those reporters, their computers are seized or their offices or homes are raided, um, we uh, in the US and that reporter and around the world doesn't want to have those records uh, sitting out there open on their computer, you know, VeraCrypt, if any of you have used that, uh, is an incredibly useful security tool, for example, allows you to hide all kinds of secret documents in its own folder. You know, I think I call mine, you know, summer holiday photos, for example, and it can only open by me with a very long password. I guess it won't be called summer holiday photos anymore, though. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we have time for two more questions. Um, one is about the who has been writing? Who's passionate about the question? Okay, yes, I have. Yes, you, uh, you mentioned you worked with the UN eventually. Um, how difficult was it to get in touch with government officials? What was the process of getting those in some of touch with them? I was really like, curious about that. So, in the US, I just work on the US angles and with Will, and in the US, there was a lot of interest in reforming the law um, to prevent the U.S. financial system to be used and abused by people who wanted to hide, who want to hide illicit money here. So it was really kind of, I think, not on the easier side for us to get in touch with congressional staff members, for example, and others, because they took what we published in the Pandora Papers and they ran with it to yeah. pass legislation. They wanted to see what we had in advance. They were excited. A lot of excitement. 
Um, so, and we uh, are in our polling desk, had conversations with representatives of King and Villa. Um, we heard from various oligarchs, attorneys, um, you know, uh, people responded. Uh, we got their attention because we have the seats and it made the stories better. You want to get all sides, you want to get, you know, their explanation. Um, so, yeah, I think it wasn't that hard of a sell to get um, attention, reaction, and some impact, uh, especially in the last Okay, well, one more question. There was one right in the very front row. Is yes. yes. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, speaking of danger, um, I just saw where 20 uh, journalists were let go of the Washington Courier. So I'm wondering, this is just a broad question, what is the future? Yeah, <laughs> no, it's okay. I can know that. Uh, I believe people in journalism. It's never going anywhere. You know, uh, it's it takes on different forms. I worked at a uh, uh, state newspaper. I worked at a startup. I worked at two nonprofits. I worked at one of the best newspapers in the world, and they're doing amazing journalism at all of those levels. Important work, um, and, and they all have different challenges. Uh, they all, you know, the post measures success in different ways than the market does. Um, you know, nonprofits can be a, afford to sit back and, and measure things in a different way, uh, like impact, you know, versus eyeballs. Um, and there's not a wrong or right answer there. Um, I think the future of journalism will change. I, I remember thinking, oh my God, well, print papers can't ever leave. That would be a terrible disaster. It's okay. Like, we, we may not be able to print this thing and go to people's houses every every day. That's a lot of work. Um, but we're still going to tell stories and get the news out. I do think the hollowing out of um, American newspapers is a, a serious sense of democracy and has been a serious impact on our country, and, and that needs to be shored up. And um, foundations and nonprofits uh, and universities are doing really God's work and they're trying to support new forms of journalism across America. So I think um, people are going to have to get ticked off about things like Flint and not knowing about their water and other other local crises that people may not have heard about and, and because their local news organization is being called out. So I think it's going to be sort of market demand, but also creativity among those of us in academia and the nonprofit world, um, journalists who are not allowed to think favorably about how we continue telling the stories. Thank you very much uh, to all. I have no idea what time it is where you are in Germany or Nassau, but we're grateful that you're able to join us virtually. Another round of applause for 